to get started with, I just want to say again, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I'm Christy Norris. I'm the director of Carolina K-12. And as I said, Paul Benici, my colleague, is behind the scenes. If you need any kind of technical assistance, he's there to help you. I also have to say how deeply appreciative I am of the North Carolina Society, who are the funders of this entire event, this amazing group that's dedicated to preserving the history and heritage of North Carolina really believes in the power of teachers. And they specifically believe in the importance of teachers having access to free, high quality professional development. And so sadly, we know that there are not enough people in this state and in this country with that level of understanding. And I also just wanna ground us in a few words about why we at Carolina K-12 and the Watson School of Education with funding from the North Carolina Society wanted to do this series and delve into the history of Wilmington 1898, a history that as many of you noted in your applications is still very hidden, even though we are now you guys to the day tomorrow, to the day 123 years later. I don't know if you recognize tomorrow is the 123rd anniversary of the coup. So one major goal of this series is to support each of you in exploring this history, both independently and in our sessions together, and in turn to teach your students about 1898 and related themes in a way that helps them understand the implications of our past, the very, very direct connections to our present, knowing that this is how we empower them to address the challenges of the future. Brian Stevenson said that our history has scarred us, it has bruised us, it has injured us. But when we tell the truth about our history, we can change things. We can get to something that feels more like freedom. We can achieve something that looks more like justice. We can shift this narrative that has burdened us and resurrect the hope that animates many of us. And so our goal is to really help you face the hard stuff, to help you help your students face the hard stuff, but to also find the hope, the resistance, the Black agency and the resilience when doing so. Because remember that in every period of history, um, even the most violent and oppressive periods of history, there have always been people who, despite the incredible adversity that they faced, they have pushed back in all kinds of ways. And this includes the period of Wilmington, the coup, when a statewide campaign of hate and white supremacy was strategically enacted. But in the words of Dr. Hassan Jeffries, as I always love to quote, hard history is not hopeless history. And so I think it can be a real challenge to find hope within hard history, like a successful coup d'etat and white supremacy campaign, but it is there. You have to hunt for it but it's there in the history of Wilmington, in the Wilmington that existed before the coup, even in the, the, the aftermath of the coup. And one of the things that we'll keep coming back to throughout this series is really trying to find and pull out those strands of hope, because without hope and reconciliation, we really miss part of the power in facing our whole past. As Ida B. Well said, the way to right past wrongs is to shine the light of truth upon them, right? Um, and so, you know, the last thing I want to just do is go ahead up front and acknowledge the literal elephant in the room in regards to the concept of truth. Um, we 100% understand the myriad of challenges facing every single one of you and making many of you nervous, as many of you talked about in your applications. Um, who are doing this work in these especially politically charged times. We know this can feel risky. Um, we know for a multitude of reasons, this can be challenging and <laughs> the divisive and bullying rhetoric that's been waged nationally and across our state and now down to local school boards regarding so-called, you know, anti-critical race theory bills and policies is certainly complicating the matter. So I just want to be real clear about this. This is a strategic mislabeling. As you all know, um, these hostile debates and subsequent legislation are not about critical race theory, because as we all know, that's a law school curriculum that none of us are teaching to kindergartners. This is about censorship of history. And so we are well aware of the realities that you're facing. And part of our goal with this series is to help you feel confident 
in standing your ground, in teaching the truth, and know that we are here to support you in this patriotic work. And I use the word patriotic on person, on purpose. Um, when you care about something, you hold it accountable and you strive to make it better. You learn from your mistakes. One of Carolina K-12's board members, Eric Johnson, in a recent op-ed wrote that our history is neither an unbroken march of progress nor a doom loop of despair. It's a complicated mess, just like the present. And having a sense of curiosity about where we came from is an act of civic pride. So I'm gonna get down off my soapbox, but I do want you to hold on to that, hold on to that word curiosity as we go into tonight. Um, um, and thank you again to the North Carolina Society for allowing us to be here. It's because of you guys that we're able to gather and shine a light on this important history. So with that, I want to uh, get us started with the incredible Lee Ray Umfleet. Um, and you know, one thing I, I do want to encourage you to do is you listen to Lee Ray again with that sense of curiosity I mentioned earlier. I also love um, the quote by David Soselski, who wrote in the preface to another great book about Wilmington democracy portrayed. We look to Wilmington in 1898 as to all this nation's racial history, not to wring our hands in a fruitless nostalgia of pain, but to redeem a democratic promise rooted in the living ingredients of American life. So when you just keep that in your mind, maybe even in your heart, as we delve into this hard history tonight, it connects to a lot of what Clyde was saying to us. Um, and we are so lucky to have one of the most knowledgeable people about 1898, Miss Lee Ray Umfleet, who is a powerhouse. She works with the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources to develop outreach and specialty programming projects on behalf of the Secretary's Office. She has the longest career in public history. You must have gotten started when you were 12. Um, she's worked with everyone from the Office of Archives and History to the North Carol uh, Carolina Collection. She served on numerous boards, the board of directors for the North Carolina Museums Council, the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, Historic Stagville Plantation. Literally, we could be here all night talking about everything she does, but I think perhaps most relevant for this evening is she published A Day of Blood, the 1898 Wilmington Race Riot, based on the research, um, from the commission based on her own research for which she was awarded the American Association of State and Local History Award of Merit and their prestigious WOW Award. This book is incredible and you are all getting a copy thanks to the North Carolina Society this Saturday when we see you. Um, it's, I mean, I'm telling you, this is a one-stop shop of everything, including primary sources that you can use in your classroom. And so Lee Ray Umpleet, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. I'm going to turn it over to you. Lee Ray is going to spend about 40 minutes or so, I think, talking about the history, and then we're going to open it up for you guys to ask some questions and have a discussion. So. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. So three years of researching and writing turned into this report. And then I turned it into that book. The book was published in 2009. It was reprinted last year. And um, it's become a foundational piece for the work that uh, the Third Person Project's doing and a group of genealogists in town in Wilmington are doing. And I never thought that the work I did almost 20 years ago would still be so very relevant today. Um, so I'm going to jump into a short presentation that it's three years worth of work summarized in 40 minutes. I'm going to necessarily have to skim over some things. Uh, if when we get to the question and answer session, you have a burning question about another topic that I didn't cover, I'll be more than happy to jump in and see what we can do to answer your questions. So I'm going to share my screen. So um, I started this journey with the events in Wilmington with the 1898 Wilmington Race Riot Commission that was created as a result of the centennial activities that were done in town in 1998. And as a result of that work, we, the Department of National and Cultural Resources was given a charge to determine the causes and effects of the violence in Wilmington in 1898. I was a researcher in the research branch 
my passion throughout my career in history has been bringing to light un undertold, underrepresented histories. And so this was totally right down my alley. And I spent the next three years diving deep into the conspiracies and the tragedies of 1898. I have been tied to calling it the Wilmington Race Riot because of the work tied to the Wilmington Race Riot Commission. However, there are many, many descriptors for that event. Massacre, certainly. Uh, coup d'etat, yes. Tragedy, all of it. Um, I try not to get people caught up in words because words sometimes can uh, get in the way of trying to learn the truths of things. So I do call it the race riot in my book. However, uh, more than more often than not, it's a tragedy and a massacre and the coup d'etat and all of those other things when I speak. Um, there's a couple of instances where I'll be using words from history. I hope they don't offend, but um, those are the words from history and it drives home the uh, reality of some of the things that the white supremacy campaign were doing. So let's just get right in on it. The events in Wilmington were part of a larger political power struggle. November 10th, 1898, with violence and bullets in the streets was not spontaneous. It was part of a larger campaign. And we have Democrats and Republicans of 1898 that we have to discuss in this power struggle. And first things first, Democrats and Republicans of 1898 are not Democrats and Republicans of 2021. They're almost diametrically opposed. The Democrats of 1898 were led by Fernifold Simmons and he was um, an attorney and a, an amazing planner. And he's just, wow, he didn't have Twitter and uh, Excel databases and 24-hour uh, news cycles, but he managed to manipulate the media to his interests. And so Democrats of 1898 under Simmons are most often conservative. They are former Confederate uh, soldiers, and they um, are living under the platform of white supremacy. The white supremacy platform piece had always been part of the Democratic Party campaign since the end of Reconstruction in 1877, but in 19, 1898 was the first successful use of that campaign plan. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have Governor Daniel Russell, who was a Republican. Republicans were most often the party of African Americans, and they were also uh, leading businessmen, progressives, people who moved to North Carolina after the Civil War from other states. And the middle party, the one that st gets stuck in the midst of all of the push and pull and tugging is the Populist Party. And the Populist Party was um, came into uh, that third party, third party strong status in the 1880s. And it was mainly created as a result of disaffected Democrats who felt like the Democratic Party wasn't meeting their needs. And in the 1890s, populists and Republicans realized that in order to defeat Democrats at the ballot box, because neither party had a voting majority to beat the Democrats solely, they had to combine and fuse and push their votes together to defeat the Democrats. This fusion activity was um, successful. It was a tenuous partnership between the populists and the Republicans because each had to give up a little bit of what they wanted in order to compromise and uh, win the ballot. Um, but they were successful. Putting Russell in office as the first Republican governor in North Carolina had seen since the end of Reconstruction. The result in the legislature of this fusion victory meant that Democrats were a minority voting party in the legislature and laws across the state were made more egalitarian and African-Americans who had a larger voice in government in North Carolina at all levels from the cities to the counties to the state legislature. And so when Simmons was thinking about the long game of how the Democratic Party was going to get back into power, the thing he first realized is that he needed to break apart fusion. 
so he found ways to pull these populist voters away from the Republican Party back to the Democratic Party and to uh, coerce white Republicans into either not voting or voting for the Democratic Party. And that's what we'll talk about next. Simmons had this big strategy for victory because 1898 was a midterm election for Daniel Russell as our governor. The election for that year would seat people in the state legislature and they would seat people in the um, Congress, but not for the governor's office, not for control of the city government. This was purely to get control of the state legislature. So he used a variety of people who could write, speak, and ride. And we'll go into more detail about these. I use these, this construct uh, because Josephus Daniels, uh, the editor of the News and Observer, used this in his book on his um, autobiography. And I thought it was a great way to organize how Simmons was so successful in organizing these various prongs of attack. Men who could write, Daniels in his newspaper, the Raleigh News and Observer. The News and Observer ran articles and editorial cartoons in support of the Democratic Party and the white supremacy platform throughout the summer and fall of 1898, building up a pitch of um, the, the content from a slow burn to very fiery uh, recreating of speeches from people and uh, um, articles that Daniels even said, sometimes they weren't true, but they served to serve his purpose and he would never issue a retraction, even if he found out later the story wasn't true. So the cartoons were something that was relatively new in the equation. And this is one of the many cartoons that were put in the News and Observer in 1898. And we have to remember that not everyone was as um, literate as we are now. And someone could pick up the paper and understand what the newspaper was all about when they saw this cartoon. Negro rule with their control of the ballot box was clearly a dangerous thing for our women and children. They're coming for our families, men. We have to do all that we need to do to protect our women, our children, and the ballot box for the sanctity of our country. There were newspaper articles of all types. The um, article here where Rebecca Ladder Felton says that we should lynch a thousand men a day if necessary is, is just one example of this inflammatory set of articles that would be published on a regular basis. And the business and politics section of the Wilmington Messenger, the Chamber of Commerce declares against Negro domination. These all work together to all up and down the economic chain of readers of these papers to organize, to pull together behind a single purpose of white supremacy, the, the male voters in Wilmington, New Hanover County and North Carolina. The, remember the six handbill down in the bottom left corner? There were six perceived leaders of the Republican party who were white men in Wilmington. These men were targeted with harassment and um, pressure to uh, retract their membership in the Republican Party and come out in support of the Democratic Party. One man did cave to the support or to the pressure and the number became five. Remember the five. So this was not just against black men, but also against white Republicans. Men who could speak. These are speech makers. In the days before um, 24 hour news cycles and Facebook and Twitter, people would get their political information and get to know their political leaders by those political candidates doing circuits around their district to meet and uh, speak to the voters. Alfred Moore Waddell was a Wilmingtonian and he was a very fiery speech maker who traveled around on behalf of the Democratic Party. And Josephus Daniels even said, or was it Charles B. Acock, 
one of the leaders of the Democratic Party said that Waddell was so good at portraying the tragedies of um, Negro domination in Wilmington that he made the cause of Wilmington the cause of the entire state. And so all eyes were focused on Wilmington and Wilmingtonians decided that they were gonna do more as we'll learn than just win the election. This is a section of a speech that was reprinted in the newspaper that Waddell gave on the day before the election. And you can see exactly what they thought about how the campaign needed to go. Be ready. If you see a black man out voting, tell him to leave. If he doesn't, shoot him. We shall win tomorrow if we have to do it with guns. You cannot get any more clear about how he thought they needed to proceed. And then we have men who could ride. These are red shirts. The red shirt phenomenon came into North Carolina in the 1898 election season. It was um, brought into the state by South Carolinians who had successfully used the red shirt uh, prototype to break the hold of reconstruction in that state. And South Carolinians were brought into North Carolina. They spoke with people like Waddell and Alfred Moore Aycock and Daniels and Simmons and all the other leaders of the party to explain how the red shirts could work. And essentially the red shirts were um, armed militia that was sanctioned by the Democratic Party. And wherever there was a speech by someone like Waddell in a community, there was also a red shirt rally leading up to the speech and then after the speech. And then they'd follow it with a barbecue. And the red shirts, uh, of course, had red shirts. They were made by ladies in the community. This is a photograph of red shirts in Laurenburg, North Carolina on November 8th, 1898. And they are just outside the... Um, voting area in Laurenburg. We don't have any images yet of red shirts from Wilmington. I always hope that new information keeps coming to light because people are still researching and re-researching 1898. And I think that at some point we'll have more information. But these red shirts in Laurenburg are a good representative sample of what they were like. We have a flag, we have guns, we have uh, lots and lots of guns actually. And these men are right outside the polling place in Laurenburg. Um, so you can pretty much assume that this is not a free and clear election. Now, why Wilmington? Wilmington was the largest city in North Carolina at the time. It had about 20,000 people in the city and it was a majority African-American by a slim majority. They, the city had a coalition, white, black leadership running the city on the board of aldermen, a white mayor who was a Republican. We had black members of the city board of aldermen in place. We had um, black businesses in the main business district with white and black customers. And it was very, very profitable city to be in. It was the largest city. It was a port. It was an international port shipping lumber, and tar pitch and turpentine, as well as cotton all over the world. Anyone that was living in Wilmington was doing better economically and socially than anywhere else in North Carolina. African-Americans had a higher rate of home ownership in Wilmington than other parts of North Carolina. Education levels were higher in Wilmington for everyone, including African-Americans in Wilmington. The uh, businesses were thriving and prospering, day laborers and people that work the ships and all other kinds of laboring classes all made higher wages in Wilmington than laboring classes in other parts of the state. So it was what the New South could have become at the cusp of the 20th century because of the economic booms that were being seen in the city. Now that's not to say it was a utopia because there was still racism, there were still problems, there were still struggles, but it was moving in a direction that it could have become even larger and even more prosperous had November 10th not happened. 
African-American community was growing. We had churches, civic groups, we had educational facilities. There were schools teaching people to be teachers and sending them off to universities all over the uh, country. And the largest employer was the cotton compress. There's a photograph at the bottom right. The cotton, cotton press, the cotton compress employees were some of the highest paid employees in the city and were very well trained and respected employees. Now we add to the mix Alex Manley. Alex Manley was an African American, although he is very light skinned, he's mixed race. And he was the editor of the Wilmington Daily Record. It was a newspaper that was geared to the African American readers, but it was also uh, subscribed to, had advertisements in uh, by white residents of the city. And Manly, just like there were pro Democratic Party newspapers, Manly's paper was a pro Republican newspaper. His, tool, his paper was a tool for information about Republican candidates and Republican philosophies. And Manley also took the opportunity to write editorials to rebut some of the things that were being published in the pro-Democratic Party papers. In fact, he wrote an article that um, sort of pointed to what Rebecca Latimer Felton was saying when she said, all white men need to do all they can to protect white women in a speech that she gave. And she said that black men to a man really only wanted to do pretty much one thing and that was to rape white women. And in order to protect those white women, you must lynch a thousand men a day. And Manley wrote a rebuttal that pointed out that um, white women had been seeking out partnerships with black men for generations. And he, as a mixed race child of a former enslaved woman, was evidence of another problem that came out of slavery, which was forced relationships and children that came from those forced relationships. And so he became a target of the Democratic Party campaign as the season moved forward. And he became an example and was used as a target. And he had his business in the downtown district. And as a result of the pressures, he had to move from the downtown district to another space that was operated by a church outside of the district so that he would be no, not as easily targeted. And plus the owner of the building where he had his uh, printing press didn't want his building to get damaged by vandals. So Manley uh, continued to run his paper throughout the rest of the campaign season, but he never went anywhere alone. He always had bodyguards and he was clearly uh, understanding his role as a target of the white supremacy campaign. So election day comes November 8th, 1898, and the Democratic Party had done such a good job of keeping voters away from the polls who were uh, Republicans and intimidating uh, white men into voting for the Democratic Party and also intimidating Republican candidates away from even putting their name on the ballot that the Democratic Party won every seat that they had a candidate up for. And so it was a full sweep. That translates into the 1899 new state legislature would be a Democratic Party dominated body and no longer a party of fusion with Republicans and populists and Democrats running it. It was a fully Democratic legislature with a majority. Now, Wilmingtonians couldn't rest on their laurels. The next day, November 9th, they get together because remember the election on November 8th was not for the uh, control of the city of Wilmington, the mayor's office and the board of aldermen. And so they, these men had worked so very hard to win the state legislature, they couldn't deal with not also being in control of the city. So we, the undersigned citizens, do hereby declare that we will never be ruled by men of African origin. This has come to be known as the White Declaration of Independence. And then they laid out a series of demands. 
Alfred um, Moore Waddell was our chair of a white committee that pulled together a group of black leaders to present these demands. They wanted the board of aldermen and the mayor to resign. Alex Manley needs to leave the city, stop printing his paper. And they wanted to point to um, hiring whites over blacks and things like that. And so this black group of city leaders that was given these demands were given until the next morning on the 10th to provide a response to Waddell and his committee of 25 white leaders. Of course, these men, their response was that we wanna do all that we can to promote safety and peace in our city and we'll do what we can but we really don't have the authority to make any of those things happen. Waddell demanded a reply by the next morning. He had been given an answer prior to that morning, but the official reply didn't make it to him in time because Wilmington was an armed camp. In the months leading up to the election, each block in the white part of town was developed with a series of black captains who were white men who had weapons. And under these black captains were other men who patrolled this block. They knew how many men, women, and children were on the block, how many guns were on the block, and what was needed to be done to protect the folks in that block. And they patrolled. And if you are a black person traveling from one end of the city to the other, at every corner, you were going to be met by these patrols asked why you were going, where you were going, what you were doing, and um, many times you were roughed up. So it was a difficult thing for even people who worked in the white community to travel from their homes in the black community to get into their um, employer's houses. The response to Waddell was delayed because of these block captains and their harassment practices. So the next morning on November 10th, Waddell and his crew come to the Wilmington Light Infantry Armory that's uh, photographed here. And the Wilmington Light Infantry was the precursor to what we now call the National Guard. And so there was this group of trained militiamen who were officially sanctioned by the governor of North Carolina to protect the area, who were held and the armory and citizens from around the community met Waddell at the armory. And they were full of angst, full of needing something to be done, full of um, whiskey, some of them, because whiskey had been distributed amongst the um, populations in celebration um, by the Democratic Party. And they had also been distributing guns to these same people. And they came to the armory to hear Waddell and the answers from the committee of 25 at that point. Waddell arranged the men in the streets into skirmish lines and they marched to Alex Manley's printing press building from the armory. They knocked on the door, they broke in the door, Manley had been warned ahead of time that uh, there was a group of men headed his way. So he was on his way out of town when this happened. There were patrols on the outskirts of town. Alex Manley's descendants have been told and have passed along that Manley was stopped. They asked him, have you seen that boy Manley? And he said, no, haven't seen him because Remember, Alex Manley is very light skinned and his brother was with him who was also light skinned and they um, didn't have their pictures blasted all over social media. So nobody really knew what he looked like. They had an idea, a stereotypical vision of what Alex Manley looked like, but they didn't really know. And so Manley said, no, haven't seen him. And they said, um, do you have a gun? And Manley says, no, I don't have a gun. And they gave him a gun and they said, if you see him, you shoot him. He said, sure thing, will do, and rode out of town. He ended up in Philadelphia by the time it's all said and done, uh, living with his wife and family. And um, he came back to visit a few times, but never really uh, was able to restart the business successes he had in Wilmington in other places. So 
Alex Manley's printing press building is damaged by fire and they um, start a fire in the first floor. They prevent the firefighters from getting to the building until it's fully engaged and then allow them to put it out only once the building is completely destroyed, but before it catches nearby houses on fire. They stop to take a photograph. This was published in a newspaper up in the northern parts of the country after the event. Here's another photograph that was taken by a local photographer from a different angle of the destruction of the building. And I zoomed in on these people because I wanted us to see and understand that they're very happy and proud of what they've done. They're highly weaponized. They've got bats and guns and knives and all kinds of things. And they've broken in, they destroyed private property and they were enabled and encouraged by the political rhetoric that was presented to them over the course of the 1898 campaign season. And no one was ever held accountable for what happens in the city on the day of November 10th. And um, it was, emer it emerged as something that was a um, point to brag about if you were in Wilmington and participating in the activities of November 10th, 1898. So here again are some more photographs of the press building. Once the white supremacists destroyed the printing press for Alex Manley, that destroyed the ability of the black community to communicate across the various pieces of the city to help them uh, coalesce around responses to what was happening or to combat them politically. Once the building was destroyed, Waddell, after the photos were taken, told the men at the printing press building to disperse, to go home, that they had done their duty. However, we now know that on the other side of town, someone who witnessed everything said hell broke loose at the intersection of 4th and Harnett. And we also, when we were doing the research, I had an intern look into the concepts of mob violence and mob mentality. And I believe that some of the people who were involved in the activities on November 10th, 1898, were so very much full of the rhetoric and the propaganda and this newfound hate of black people that they lost their moral compass and um, used their new guns to react to um, what they saw in the streets. That's not to forgive anyone, it's just a method and a tool for understanding. Even with some of the things that have happened here recently in our recent history with uh, violence that we've seen over 2020 and 2021, many times people who are interviewed after the fact have said, I don't know why I did what I did. I, I, I wouldn't have done that normally. Uh, but it became, as I said before, a celebratory point to remember your participation in November 10th, 1898. So they were very much enabled. So after those people left the burning of the printing press, they arrive on the opposite end of town at 4th and Harnett. There's a trolley stop. You can see the trolley tracks right here. And the photographer behind the photographer was a group of white men on the corner, directly across from the corner that you see in the photograph. And at this corner in the photograph were a group of black men who had left their jobs to uh, try to get to their families to see what was going on. They heard the gunshots, they saw the smoke, they heard the fire bell, and they knew something was going on. And um, the men at both opposite sides of this intersection started yelling at each other. A police officer later testified that the only people at the intersection with guns were the white men. And he realized that his attempt to disperse the crowd was not working. So he left that intersection to try to find support or because he didn't want to get killed himself and shots rang out. Those X's on this photograph are where the first two black men died on the morning of November 10th. From this point, it turns into a running firefight 
and people are running in every direction. If you were black, you literally had a target on your back. And guns and arms come into the city with um, more and more men flying into the north end of town at Brooklyn, where you're going to be this coming weekend, from other parts of the city. Add to the chaos and the confusion, we have a machine gun. There were actually two or three machine guns in the city. This one was purchased by the businessmen of the city for the protection of the white residents. And the Wilmington Light Infantry was trained on using the gun. And the machine gun squadron was chaired and led by William Keenan. William Rand Keenan's father, who is the namesake for many of the things that we have around UNC. I'm a Carolina girl, but I have to admit these things. The gun is mounted on the back of the wagon. They pulled it to various places in town, aimed it at groups of people and buildings that they wanted to search. Just prior to the election, the gun came into town and they brought a group of uh, black men, leading citizens of the city, onto a boat with the gun and they rode it out into the middle of the river and shot the gun into the trees both to practice how to use the gun and to show these men what this gun could do. And it was an intimidation tool to prevent these men from reacting should they see this gun come into their community. The gun was pulled into this area called Manhattan Park a little bit later in the afternoon on November 10th. The white building you see here at the right side of the screen was a community center and it had been surrounded by an eight foot fence that you see lying on the ground here because it was cut down by gunfire. There was a report of someone inside Manhattan Park firing at patrols of white men and the machine gun and other people came in to flush out the shooter and this is the result. Manhattan Park's tree right here is still there. I go visit her every time I go to Wilmington. Um, the lot is empty now, and I have, based on my research, anywhere from two to 25 people killed at this intersection, and I believe that the machine gun was used at this intersection. So one of the things I've done when I've met with the community is to talk about places where some of this violence happened, and Manhattan Park is at the corner of Sixth and Blade. You can see this map here. These are fire insurance maps. Uh, the Sanborn Company drew to know what the buildings and situations were like in the city for insurance purposes. And so in 1898 map, you see Manhattan Park. By 1904, the next map that you have access to, the building has been torn down. This is a modern map from Google Earth and it's still a vacant lot. I used to work with um, the, the folks in the city to do talks similar to the one I'm doing now to try to help people in the community understand and learn about what was going on in Wilmington. And also to find out if there was any um, collections of letters or diaries inside private collections that might help flesh out the story. And a woman who used to live on this block somewhere over in one of these houses, she was an elder. And she told me that that lot, that lot had always been vacant, that there had never, ever been anything there. And once I showed her these stories and showed her the photographs, she was amazed that the landscape had disappeared to witness the violence. So that's a problem that Wilmingtonians have. You're going to go to Wilmington, you're going to see there's a lot of vacant lots where important things happened in the city. And that's one of the struggles that they have is how to physically remember what happened in 1898. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Back to the history. This is Third Street where two more African-American men were killed. Um, I don't know who they were. I don't have records to tell me who they were. I think I know who one of them was. I think it was Daniel Wright is one of those, but I'm not exactly sure. There are not uh, death certificates. They weren't required by the state at the time. So we don't have official documentation to identify those who were killed. I sort of did what an attorney might do. And every time I saw a reference to someone witnessing a death, 
I made a notation and I pulled all of those things together. And when I thought that there were multiple witness recounts in the same death, I pulled those into one singular reference point for uh, someone being killed. So I think anywhere from 40 to 60 people were killed. Could be more, could be as many as 200. I just don't have documentation to tell me who they were. So it's what an attorney in court calls circumstantial evidence with the exception of a handful of people to tell us who died. Unfortunately, there are a lot of unknowns in that part of the story. Now, something that is known is what these white leaders did on the afternoon of November 10th. They came together and called the city board of aldermen and the mayor to city hall where there were about 200 armed men. A coup d'etat is a is a armed overthrow of a legally elected government. And on the afternoon of November 10th, Alfred Moore Waddell, that speech maker who watched the burning of the building, had a committee of white men meet the board of aldermen. And the way the city charter was written, if someone on the board of aldermen resigned, the existing board would vote to fill the vacancy and that person would sit in that position until the next election. So following the rule of law, one by one, people were resigning their positions and Waddell and the white supremacists in the Democratic Party had someone ready to fill that vacancy. So in the course of the afternoon, the city went from a legally elected government to one that was put in place by violence and threats of violence. So we do have a coup d'etat in Wilmington. Um, as a historian, you don't like to say this is the only, this is the first, the biggest, the last, and none of those superlatives. However, it does look as if this is the only successful coup d'etat in United States history. There had been attempts to overthrow city, county governments in other states, but those were always overturned for some reason, whether the army came in or the federal government intervened. But in Wilmington, I call it successful because those men who were put in place on November 10th in the afternoon sat in the Board of Aldermen's roles until the next election in March 1899. And the Democratic Party was once again voted into control of the city um, that day. So we have a successful coup d'etat. The aftermath, we see burial of the dead, a banishment campaign because leaders in the community were uh, rounded up by the white uh, armed bands, taken to the uh, jail and put in jail overnight, put on trains the next morning. These are civic leaders, business leaders, community leaders, church leaders, uh, anyone who would have a role in the Republican Party or in any efforts to combat what was happening in the city. On top of that, there was a mass exodus. Wild bullets were flying in the streets. People were fleeing their homes into the swamps, into the cemeteries for safety. Many never came back. Some came back just long enough to get their affairs in order and then they left. This precedes the great migration out of the South and into the North by 10, 15, 20 years. That also results in a change in workforce and economic status for business owners. Firing Blacks and hiring Whites became the policy of all businesses in the county and city governments. And then on top of that, we have a suffrage amendment that gets passed in 1900, which virtually eliminates the Black voice in politics and voting until the middle of the 20th century and the uh, Voting Rights Act. We just had a ceremony to rebury, re-acknowledge, memorialize, whatever terms you need to use for that. Uh, Joseph, jo Joshua Halsey, one of the murder victims on November 10th, 1898. So the legacy, Jim Crow and separate but equal. 1899, the new legislature comes into uh, office, and one of the first laws they pass is separate but equal. It's segregation of the races in train cars. North Carolina had not had any legislation that reflected the Plessy versus Ferguson separate but equal law from 1896, the Supreme Court decision from 1896. It begins with separation of the races in 1899 and then moves forward into all aspects of life. 
public memory, memory of what happened in Wilmington 1898 in both the white and black communities fades within two generations. We are just now relearning the truths of 1898. The narrative that was created by the white winners, Alfred Moore Waddell, and all of those other types of leaders from the Wilmington coup, all wrote an alternative narrative to explain what happened and why it happened. And not until the work of me and other historians, people whose shoulders I stood on, did we start to really understand the truth of what happened. I threw this slide in really fast. This is from this past weekend. The New Hanover County of Community Remembrance Project did a soil collection ceremony where uh, jars were filled with soil from the places that I identified where people died. And then descendants came to Wilmington to commemorate because the community also is doing a wonderful job in trying to find and identify descendants who have been scattered across the diaspora of the United States. This fellow up at the top right photograph with the cane, he is a descendant of Alex Manley who lives in California and he did not know his descendancy. He sent me an email, actually he sent me a message on LinkedIn after January 6th when I had done an interview with a newspaper and he wanted to know more about his potential ancestry. He wasn't even really sure if he was descended from Alex Manley. And I referred him to some folks in Wilmington and they have really, really done a great job to pull people like Kieran back into the fold and bring them home to Wilmington and New Hanover County. Quickly, my research method, I looked at everything I could look at. And I did this all in the days before Google and ancestry.com and so people who are re-researching and digging around have newspapers.com and all of these wonderful electronic digital resources to find new information. So I'm very, very excited for what might still be out there that we will learn in the future. <laughs>